All right, so what's going on, people? Yours truly, Cockney Prince Quincy, officially in the building. Um, it's an Extra Time Friday special on behalf of Behind the Badge. And today, it's going to be a great pleasure to speak to, not even interview, I say speak to, the police commission himself, Mr. Mark Rowley. So, look, I want to ask you first thing first, yeah? Um, you've been in the role for, like, a year now? No, four months. Four, well, be a bigger part, yeah, four <laughs> months, right? So... But previously, you, you retired from the police force. Yeah. yeah so, but for about a year. Was it about no, four years, I was out. You was out for four years? Yeah. Right, did my research down the road. Yeah. <laughs> you in those four years while you was retiring, like, what, was, what, was, what was on your mind? What was you thinking about? Was, was, the, was, the, was the police uh, service or force, was it, was it off your mind or was it just no, it wasn't. It, it wasn't off my mind. So I, um, I, the last job I did, I was running the cancer terrorism side of policing. Mm. And then I decided like four or five years ago that... Um, time for a new challenge and I, I didn't think I was going to find it in policing so I did some stuff in the private sector I caught a bit of time to be honest I was a bit more relaxed I um, I bought myself an Aston Villa season ticket um, which, oh, is, wow. which is which uh, is I'm, 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 I'm an adopted Londoner I've been here 25 years but yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. from Birmingham and um, so I've now got an Aston Villa season ticket which is like all football fans, it's you always believe your team's going to be amazing next year, and they never are. So in the, in that in that season ticket, you was I mean, they got relegated then. Yeah, so as I bought it, we'd already been relegated. So, oh, okay. So it's so good. You're a true it, fan. So so it's good. So it was so actually it was it was cheaper, and I got a better seat. Oh, <laughs> and, well, yeah, and yeah. And now there's like I think about a ten thousand waiting list for season tickets. So it's so I'm, I'm not going to give it up, even though it's. With this job, it's hard to get to the games, but I'm, I don't want to give it up. Well, I can't lie to you. I mean, I've got a little soft spot for Aston Villa from the Gordon Cowan's days. And, oh, fact, he was amazing, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Like... And Mark Waters and all that kind of guys. Yeah. So they're a great team from the, when they beat Bayern Munich in the... Yeah, in the, in the, in the, in the final in 82, yeah. So, okay, um, then, no, that's, 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 that's so, so, But I'm supporting through thick and thin. So, so that's a proper lads answer, right, between... There's always a common, a common ground, it's, it's, it's football. Football, yeah. Regardless of Who's your team? team? So, I, see, I'm born in East London, but I support Liverpool. Oh, a glory hunter. <laughs> no, <I'm> all... <laughs> you are. Yes. Come on, you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, Terry McDermott was my favourite player. So, Amazing, yeah, yeah. Growing up. So Great I, I, era. I was always fascinated with Terry, Terry McDermott. And basically, he had similar hairstyle to my dad. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> that was it. So, like, so you've taken time out. You've, yeah. you've come, what, what brought you back to, to, to the job, to the role? So I, I, I thought I'd moved on from policing in my mind and, and sort of, I mean, I've, I've always loved it. Um, it was all I ever wanted to do when I was at school was join the police. And then I thought I'd moved away from it. And um, my wife thought I still had an itch. I didn't think I did, but it's annoying when your wife's right, isn't it? And then the um, the last commissioner resigned and like within a day or two, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go for this. Um, I I think the, th the thing for me was policing, policing matters so much because we all want to live somewhere where we feel safe and we can enjoy our lives and thrive. And um, it upset me to see policing in a difficult moment, and I, I felt sort of, I felt the need to come back and try and help help deal with it. When you say you you you've got to go for the role in the, yeah, in the yeah. previous commissioner, did you get a call, help? Uh, of course, you get phone calls. <laughs> some of things goes on. So some of it's about so you. They so, give you a call. It's like, uh, yeah. we need, I need your help. Yeah. So some of it's about yeah. <laughs> so some of it's about do you want it? Some of it's yeah. about do they want you? Of course, and then. There was like a massive long interview process that sort of there was um it sort of took lots of stages and then it finished up i had um like three interviews in three days with the policing minister the home secretary who was pretty patel then and yeah. with sadiq and sort of so that was like bang 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 and then that was tuesday wednesday thursday and then friday they phoned me up and said you've got the job we're going to announce this at lunchtime so it went from i've got three or four interviews to come over in the next two weeks and then in three or four days You've got the job. It's like, crikey, here we go. Like, haven't you? Didn't you put, apply for the job before? Yeah, yeah, I applied when the last commissioner got it, and yeah. they chose somebody else. So. So, so, what's different getting it this time than you previously would have gone through it before? Um, so, I think I was. I think it, I'm. I'm going to be a better commissioner doing it now than doing it before. Um, I hope he said touching wood <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. because I think having had having had four years out. I think you just become a bit more objective. You see issues a bit more clearly. I mean, when you're in an organisation, I only spent the last six years of my policing career in the Met. The other like 25 years I was in Surrey doing some national organised crime work as well in mm. West Midlands where I started in Birmingham. So I've worked in policing for that period of time. But um, you get, you can't avoid the 
see the world part way, part, largely as a police officer. So you get your eyes set. It's hard to be completely objective. I think being outside for four years, and some of the work I was doing was with police forces, some of it was entirely separate. But I think I just got a different perspective. So I think I'm more clear in why I came back. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't need to come back. I had, frankly, I was, you know, I was doing fine. I was, I was doing, no, I, was, well, I was doing fine. I was yeah, enjoying yeah. the work I was doing. It was less pressured. Um, I really wanted to though, and so I wasn't going to come back unless I think actually this is, this is what I think I need to do as commissioner. And if, if um, Sadiq and the Home Secretary, if that's what they want, great. If that's if that's not what they want, then that's fine. I'll continue doing what I'm doing. But here I am, so. No, you've, you've taken on the role, and 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 I, and I will say and appreciate it, it's a role which is is challenging. That's for uh, certain. And, and and I'm saying challenging in a, in a sense because it's political. Your yeah. role, it's it's more than policing. So, in that sense, yeah, how do you keep your opinions neutral? across the board because you're covering so much different demographics yeah from the black community the political community Brexit so how do you how do you keep them balanced so I think when you're a public figure in a role like this you have to be really clear why you're a public figure I'm a public figure because I'm the top police officer in London so my opinion matters possibly when it's about policing when it's based on policing what's working what's not working what help we need how we work with communities it, and that's legitimate if i if i start talking about political things if i talk talking about social policy and history that's i'm i'm, I'm getting outside my lane and that's i think in the past i can think because sort of, i'm not going to name them i can think of yeah. one or two senior cops who've done that and i think it's a mistake because my voice is only important as a police officer, if I get over, over confident and want to talk about political views or social views, that's wrong. It has to be about policing and communities and what works, and that's that's my that's my legitimacy. I want to make sense. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I get that because this brings into the next question. I want to understand your role because your boss is, is, is the Home Secretary and uh, Sadiq, yeah, Sadiq, right? So they make decisions, yeah, which. Or, or put things policies through, which uh, affect the the borough, the, the London we yeah, exactly. represent. So, just how much can you fight back against that? You say no, that's I think that's a wrong. Is that when your your role comes into play? Completely. So, so you, you've got that authority to authority. say authority. So there's, there's, we talk about having operational independence, right? And so uh, there's, there's there's lots of grey in the middle, but if we do the sort of the the black and the white, if you like. At one end of the spectrum, who, who we're going to arrest, how we're going to police a protest, how we're going to deal with a particular case, that is nothing the politicians can influence. The politicians are there on behalf of the public, so if there's a high profile case, it's perfectly fair to, answer, to, to ask questions about why are you doing it that way, that doesn't make sense, and that's them sort of checking up on us on behalf of you as a voter, and that's fine, but it would be wrong, and they would never dream, they would almost say, well, well, I'm a, I'm a bit worried about this case. I want you to arrest so and so. That's not their decision. That's our decision because you you want policing to be independent of politics. So that's really important. At the other end of the spectrum, big decisions about the law and about I know national policy about budgets, they make those decisions, um, and that's right as well. And in the middle, there's a bit of grey zone that we have to work to work through together on. But fundamentally, the policing of London is not influenced by politicians. And so one of the issues you might look at is is protest. So protest is by its definition political and contentious and sometimes you'll have protest groups that are more sort of left wing in their thinking and sometimes more right wing. It's really important that we're without fear or favour. We yeah. just deal with the issues as they are based on the law and we, don't, we shouldn't care what the cause is, we just need to be fair. Politicians may have sympathies for one side or the other but that's, that's fine but our job is just to be completely fair by the law. So you've... Technically, that's your team. Yeah. You, 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 you report to and you yeah. vibe off of. Yeah. Um, and every every role you need a uh, position, you need a good team. Exactly. So what is it about your team and how, how have you assembled your team and work with you to make this role easier for yourself and, and better for the... So I can take up golf or something, that yeah. easy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to be that easy. So, um, so when you've got um, a difficult challenge ahead and, and so we've had some 
challenges and we've got a and, and there's lots of things that are great about the Met but there's lots of things that need to, to change as well. I need a team that are on the same page that we can work together on. The important thing about team is it needs to be a collective. So whilst I'm setting the starting direction, if it's all about me, we're not going to succeed. So I'm the starting point for the ideas and the thinking, but it needs to be more collective, both in terms of the thinking and also um, uh, building the plan and taking all our people with us and working with, say, working with London's community. So, and, and that team has to be diverse. I think we talk about sort of diversity in organisations in the context often of social justice and its fairness and representation. And of course, that's important, particularly in policing. But the thing that is really important to me in the team is the more difference I have in the team around me, the more difference of ideas and experience, the better we will be because you, you don't have groupthink. If you have a, a sort of a monocultural bunch of white men running an organisation, the problem is you're more likely to think in a certain way. The more you can have people with a range of backgrounds and a range of ways of thinking, the better you stand chance you stand. I mean, it's, we don't talk about that enough in policing, but sort of if you look at, at business internationally, business internationally recognise that the best companies have diverse top teams because yeah. they're not blindsided by anything because they can understand the world and particularly in a complicated, diverse, exciting city like London, which has been my home now for 25 years. So yeah. you need to understand and, it. And, and Birmingham as well. So Birmingham as well, where I grew up, exactly, yeah, yeah very much, well. yeah. So, like I said, you, you've, you've gathered your team um, and your job, you, you contracted. Yeah, five-year five contract, Five-year yeah. contract. But in those five years contract... Unless they get rid of me before Yeah, then. yeah, before they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which they won't do. Yeah, but in, in those times, you could have situations where your bosses could, could go due to public yeah, pressure. Yeah, yeah. So do, do those plans you've put into place, like a football manager, do they have to all start again or do you continue with the same focus? Um, so my my intent would be the same plan continues. So the way the, the way the law works is I'm allowed to create my own plan. The mayor has the plan for policing and safety in London and the Home Secretary has one nationally. My plan has to take account of those but I don't have to slavishly follow it. Obviously, if I do something entirely different, yeah. they're gonna, we're probably going to fall out. That's not going to be the case. But I've taken account of what they've both said and come up with a plan that I think we can make sense in London. And of course, the bare bones of that we discussed in my interview. So there I was talking about the three things I saw as important were about trust, crime and standards, that what I think I need to do on my watch is we've got to build more trust, we're going to deliver less crime in London, and raise standards because we flipped up on our standards of some of our people. So those three things. So I've already had the conversation with them when I was being selected. If you if you appoint me, those are the three things we're going to be. I'm going to be aiming at and building a plan underneath it. And I think that reflects what you both want. Mm. And they obviously agreed with that. Otherwise, they wouldn't have appointed me. Yeah. How do you think the public views the Metropolitan Police? Um, I think people are concerned. I, so if you look at British policing, we value community policing that's our heritage um that goes back sort of when the met was founded in 1829 sir robert peel the home secretary interestingly this clock behind me mm. that was the clock in robert peel's office when he founded the metropolitan police in 1829 oh really and so so it's i used to yeah so it used to be in the it used to be in the home office but i managed to I was going to say steal it from him. But no. <laughs> I saw it come out of his mouth. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've managed to borrow it, borrow it, borrow it long term, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It long -term yeah. from the fin home office. Way. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to have it, him over the shoulder. So he was thinking about policing being about communities, not about sort of like, like paramilitary su suppression. So, and I think our tradition of community policing means there is a, a lot of residual trust in policing. But we have to be frank and... and the data is very clear and sort of is particularly over the last sort of four years or so the trust in policing in London has gone down it's not it's not broken but it's going in the wrong direction and we need to turn that corner and I, I and I think there are a range of reasons for that there is the stuff that gets talked about most is the high profile cases some of these awful cases where police officers who we, who we should have thrown out ages ago have done horrific things but actually, I think there's a bigger cause underneath it, which is more about the day-to-day -day relationship between communities. police and communities. communities. And so, um, whilst I've got to deal with some of those problem individuals, 
most of our people are good people, but how how we're organised and how we've ha how we've set set them up to police London isn't good enough. And at the cornerstone of that is community is community policing is officers on the ground in your area who you get to recognise and you have a sense that they are looking out for your area and trying to do something sensible. That's the that's the that's the bedrock. We've got to do lots of clever things with, I know, online paedophiles with fraudsters, all that sort of stuff. But it all stands on a, a, having a strong relationship, and that I think the stretches of the last ten or twenty year, ten years or so, our community policing's got a bit weaker for a whole range of reasons, and I've got to rebuild that. So behind the badge, when I was approached uh, my radio yeah. program um, to improve relationships with the black community, um, and and generally I spoke to a lot of black officers um, to, to normalise um, the the, yeah. the, the, the people's perceptions of them and sections of, 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 of the black community. So this is the community I'm from, this is the community I'm, I'm, I'm proud of. So same question, how do you think the black community's relationship is with the police? Um, it's, it's not where it needs to be. This, if, you, if I look at the trust of black Londoners is in most areas the lowest trust in that area. So whilst trust has been going down across London, it's the lowest amongst black communities. Um, and I think that oh, there's lots of complicated reasons behind that, aren't there? But I think at the bottom of it, we have a painful history in the relationship between police and black communities. Uh, we should you can go back to the 80s. You, you, you can pick yeah. different milestones, but there's clearly some times in history where things have been sort of um, awfully, awfully wrong. Um, and then we've got um, Stephen Lawrence and McPherson and all those different windows. And policing has done a lot to improve but it's not enough. And I think our improvements haven't been at the rate or the degree to which society has properly expected yeah. us. So so we we haven't closed the ground well enough. And when you look at, um, I talked to um, the to black officers I've spoken to, they have really mixed experiences. Some of them will say, I've been here seven years, it's an amazing organization, it's the best organization I've ever worked for, I've had no problems at all. Somebody else in a similar job and a different on a different team will say, This is this is this is wrong. I've had all these problems and it hasn't been properly dealt with and we're not good enough and we're we've got too much racism in the organisation. So we have racism and bias in the Met. It's not everywhere, but we haven't been strong enough at squeezing it out and, mm. and that's that's on us. And you know, I hear the thing the phrase that really stuck with me that several black officers said to me about they find it hard to be black and blue. That they sort of and like that that upsets me because here yeah, I've got great people who want to do a good job in London and they're finding it hard to be members of the black community and police officers at the same time because uh, because of that, that intersection of sort of, 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 is, of positions and that's that's upsetting and in them lies a lot of the potential for hope but only if they can feel yeah. confident in that role. It, until I started talking to black officers, I'm yeah. going to start with black officers first. Yeah. So I started talking to him and to him, so I'm, I'm friends, I, I like to class myself as friends with Alison and Daria, yeah, having yeah. a conversation with her, I've got other friends and yeah. people in behind the badge, so to speak, and listening to their stories, and they didn't come to me and say, oh, this is happening, every role you're going to get upset, and all that kind of stuff, but it was for me, what took back is like, if you're getting these issues within the job, um, and then you're getting these issues outside of the job, um, like, how do you go home? at night and sleep yeah. comfortably so is that something as your team you you say you need to address you need to tackle and and black officers have got like an open ear yeah and we've been doing sort of as so as i've arrived and we've been very frank about we're going to confront these issues um and there have been some public reports which have surfaced some of it um we've been trying to do as much engagement and conversations internally with different groups particularly, frankly, because of the different issues that are bubbling up, female officers and black officers, um, who, um, in many cases, either or both of those have had bad experiences, and trying to show people that we are serious about confronting it. I think there are there are two, two things that there's a, our rules and regulations about how we employ people and sack people and deal with people aren't as good as they need to be. And I've been trying to get the Home Secretary and, to, and the Prime Minister to change those. And they are looking at that, which is helpful. 
But regardless of those rules, uh, as our sort of systems and leadership, we've been too weak. So I can't just blame the rules. We haven't been good enough either. Mm. It's a bit of th- th- it goes both ways. So so we need to do we need to do more. And I see too many cases where our decisions have been sort of weak, frankly. Um, mm. And I sort of it's it's odd, isn't it, for an organisation where. I've got tens of thousands of people who do amazing things day in and day out. They take on dangerous people. They do amazing heroic things. Um, we get people seriously injured most weeks of doing sort of doing extraordinary things, trying to protect the public. There's all of that determination and sense of values and purpose. Yet when it comes to internally taking on those that undermine us, we lose our nerve and we haven't been strong enough. And that's yeah. that's what I've got to put back in is that that strength of confidence that if someone crosses the line, okay, anyone can make a mistake, and, yeah, yeah. But, but if someone crosses the line in terms of sort of by a long way in terms of racism and misogyny, then you've got to go, and we haven't been strong enough on that. I've always said to, 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 to make change, you, you have to take ownership to, 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 to what you've done uh, and what the, or any organisation has done. Uh, completely true. And that goes on both sides, as much as, as, yeah. as the police, police force, but the black community as well, yeah. which I'll speak for. But do you understand sometimes the the rhetoric from the black community, how they feel so used? We speak about, like you've had recent, uh, the, the, the sentences of David Carrick and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, from my radio program, Simple is, and it's well listened to and in my platform, one of the questions is, is, is like, do you understand how they feel where it's taken Sarah Everard's death to, for police to actually accept that there's some rotten apples within the police force? That is coming from the black community, from, from people listening to my show. Do you understand that, that kind of symptom and, and that rhetoric? I do, because uh, I think we've, we haven't been, we perhaps weren't ready enough to say, are there some system issues that we need to fix? It's easy, isn't it, in a big organisation to say, well, this is, this is one or two individuals who have, have let us down and behaved awfully. And not to look at the, not to look at leadership, not to look at system, and say actually, are the things that we've done that's made the situation worse? Because like everyone gets that an organisation over forty thousand people, yeah, occasionally, with the best will in the world, there'll be somebody do something awful that couldn't have been stopped. Um, but what they won't forgive us for is not doing everything possible to get rid of those people in advance, and that's what I we haven't looked hard enough to say actually could we have been better and it's only been these recent two or three recent really horrific cases that have surfaced the fact that actually some of this is on us for not rooting these people out i'll be upfront would you say that people like david carrick and other officers their whiteness has, has played a part with them to get away with so much things for this, a long time they've they've had to they've allowed because of they've blended into the into the system, they've got away with that because of their their, their white. If that was a, 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 a Asian police officer or a black officer, it would have been more scrutinised, so to speak. So, I think if I look at the the we're lifting stones and uncovering errors in history, and there's quite a lot of legacy things to be sorted out. Yeah. I think most of our failing is. We've just been too weak, full stop, whether you're sort of um, black, white or whatever. But there is also some evidence of bias that we are, we're probably too lax with everybody, but we're, we're even more lenient with white officers. So um, if you're a white officer, you do stand more chance of getting away with stuff than if you're a black officer. I think that is definitely true. Um, and the Louise Cases report shows that. So um, we've got to level up our approach to standards that the same applies to everybody. And that comes with, a, that's a society issue. So, Completely. so if, uh, if a white person was to walk into a shop, a group like white people would walk into a shop and a group of black people, society is they're going to look at the black people first. Well, it depends on the shopkeeper, doesn't it? Not everybody. It, 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 no, no, but some people. Yeah, but some but, people. Yes, as society. So yeah. the areas I live in. Yeah. The areas I live in. So how do you know that you haven't got any more officers like you, in a similar position like, like David Carrick? How, how can you rid of them out? How can you get rid of these officers? So... As you said um, earlier on, Chris, the first thing is to accept you've got a problem. So I called it out from day one that we've got some issues we've got to sort out. I think to be fair about 
most of my offices, I've got tens of thousands of good people, but I've got hundreds of people who shouldn't be here. Yeah. How do I find them? How do I deal with that? So if you accept, as I do, that you've made some bad decisions in history, you need to start going back and reviewing all of that. So we're, we're looking at all the sexually related allegations made against officers over the last decade, and we're reviewing how we've handled those. And I think we'll find that many of them have been handled perfectly well, and we'll find that many of them haven't been handled perfectly well, and that will generate new actions. We're revetting all of our people based on some wider database checks than we've, we've done before. Um, we're doing public appeals and in, sort of and inter internally and externally encouraging people to come forward, and we're seeing more reports of misconduct. So once you lift the stone, it's it's can be horrible what you find underneath it, but you've got to deal with it, and that's what um, that's what I'm determined to do. Rather than rather than say these are one or two singular cases and those are now dealt with, there's nothing to worry about actually. They've shown that we're making some mistakes that we've got to now correct. So I've got to go back in history and correct those as well as drawing in new reports and try at the same time to sort of maintain the trust and confidence of officers and staff internally. And that's really hard because there's, there's many women in the organisation who've had bad experiences who understand why I'm doing this. There's people who've not had bad experiences who don't understand it and they just think I'm in the police service trying to do a good job and why is all this um, why is all this horrible um, why is all this horrible sort of stories about us going on? I'm just trying to do a good job. So maintaining the morale of all the good people is quite hard in this context as well. And I see that's doubly hard for sort of black officers and female officers who are finding it hard to be sort of both in their own communities and here. I'll keep you short and sweet I'll go and leave what goes soon. Yeah go on. Yeah. Um, right, so I understand what you want, um, what, you're, what you're offering the public. Yeah. Yeah. Right? What would you like from the black community to, to, to improve relationships with the, from the Metropolitan Police Force? Give us a chance and work with us. We will only succeed at um, a better relationship and less crime if we work together. Now, that's hard when, there's, when we haven't always got it right, when there's a, sort of the trust issues between us. But the sad facts are that in many parts of London, the groups, not only with the lowest trust in police, but also the highest experience of crime, are black communities. The levels of victimisation of sort of is is extraordinary. The sort of um, is it sort of in terms of the difference, and so, I and mean, I've been in meetings with black community groups where there's that sense of both anger and frustration. We don't like the way you police us, and then people say to me but too many of our young men are getting stabbed. We want more help. There's that tension of sort of like, we don't like the way you're doing it, but we want more of it. The only way we're going to get through that is by working together. We need to work in a different way that is um, more collaborative and is sort of just working more jointly with communities. But we need people who are, you might be angry with stuff we've done in history and that's okay, but please be constructive with us um, because we'll only make this better by a constructive and approach. Dialogue. No. And dialogue exactly that. Well, Mark Riley, I, I appreciate you taking your time out. No, uh, thank no you very much. And hopefully, we, 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 whenever there's issues or I mean conversations to have, you know what I mean. I, I'll have a conversation. I've enjoyed chatting to you, Quincy. No, thank I, you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very thank much. You, Take care.